Good morning, Grace and friends. The theme for our Advent season this year is Pilgrimage to Bethlehem. And this week's theme is Journeying. Today we will look at three journeys. The journey of the Word of God into our lives and into the life of the world. The second is the journey of Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem from Nazareth. And the third is our own sacred journey. We might better name this sermon, The Three Journeys. I hadn't thought much recently about the journey of God's Word into our lives and the life of the world until I read today's text from Isaiah. What is the Word of God? far more than a black leather bound Bible with gold letters, far more than the big floppy Bible some preachers wave as they preach. In the Iona worship book, after the reading of scripture, the leader and the people say, for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God among us, thanks be to God. The Word of God is even vaster than that. The Word of God is more than the words we read. It is the very speaking of God, the speaking of God that brought the world into existence. Creation was the first Word of God. In Genesis, God spoke the world into being. First, the light then the day and night, then the sun and moon, then the earth and sea, then the green plants with, which give us food. And then on the climactic sixth day of creation, God spoke humankind into existence. So God created humankind in God's own image. Male and female, God created them. God not, not only spoke the world into being, some days God sang the world into being so that we might hear the music of the spheres, the music of creation everywhere. John begins his gospel with the same theme. In the beginning was the speaking of God, and the speaking of God was with God and was God. And then the word we had been waiting for all our lives and the speaking of God became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Creation was the first word of God. Then God's speaking began to spread throughout the earth. The word came to indigenous peoples through nature and spirit. The word traveled to China and was called the Tao. It traveled to India and was called the Dharma. It traveled to Israel and became the Torah. And it came to us all in Jesus' flesh and was called the Gospel. The Word of God travels also into our lives travels into our lives through family, scripture, and church. <coughs> Excuse me. And as it does, it brings life to us. In the first creed of the Hebrew people, the Shema, we are called to listen to God's word. Hear, O Israel. And then we are commanded to write the word of God upon our hearts to teach the words of God diligently to the children, to post them on our doorsteps of our houses and to talk of them when we go out. The rabbis ask the question, why did God place the word on our hearts rather than in our hearts? Their answer, God placed the word on our hearts then when the heart breaks, the words fall in. That's how it works. The heart can break with pain and sorrow, yes, but also it can break with love and beauty. The word is placed on the surface of our hearts and then it tumbles in. 
Isaiah invites us to take the word of God into our mouths like bread and wine, like the most sumptuous of feasts, and it's free. Come ye that have no money, come buy and eat. Why, the prophet asked, do you spend money for that which is not bread? Come to the feast of God's word, and it's on the house. The prophet also gives us the glorious message that the word of God, which God sends out into the world, will not fail. As God sends the rains and the snow to water the earth so that it bears fruit, so God's word goes out and doesn't return empty. It accomplishes the purposes for which God sent the word. In Leonard Bernstein's Mass, a baritone sings a solo called The Word of the Lord. Some of it goes like this. For the Word created mud and got it going. It filled our empty brains with blood and set it flowing. And for several million years, it's endured all our forums and fine ideas. And then the refrains. No, you cannot imprison the Lord, word of the Lord. You cannot scuttle the word of the Lord. You cannot abolish the word of the Lord. In 1536, William Tyndall was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. He wanted to free the Bible from the control of the church and its clergy. He wanted a Bible that a common plowboy could read. The Bible was imprisoned in 8th century Latin that, the, that only the learned could read. As he was dying in the flames, he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And guess what? Soon other English translations began to appear and in 1610 came the King James Version of the Bible authorized by the king himself. <clears throat> there have been other ways of controlling uh, and confining God's word. One already mentioned was confining God's word to the words of the Bible. Here are some more. The slave owners in America gave their slaves a highly edited Bible called the Slave Bible. It had a scant 232 verses. It took out all the passages that might lead the slaves to revolt and seek God-given freedom. For example, the story of the Exodus. And it kept all the pas passages in that taught them to be subservient to their masters. Another way of controlling and imprisoning the word of God, for centuries only men were authorized to be interpreters and preachers of the word of God. But look, God's word cannot be controlled. Our day is bringing women scholars and preachers, giving us new eyes to see God's word. We cannot abolish the word of the Lord. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. May the word of God make its journey into our hearts today. Now let's move to the journey of Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. It was a long, demanding three-day journey by foot from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It couldn't have been an easy journey for Mary. She almost full term with child. Paintings have pictured Mary riding on a donkey while Joseph walked by her side, but it must have been diff difficult whether walking or riding. But before that journey began, there was the nine-month journey of pregnancy. And that, too, was fraught with danger and difficulty. Joseph's decision to protect mother and child. 
the last minute plans to marry, her growing belly, the growing gossip of the village, the morning sickness or all day sickness, Mary as all mothers hanging over the toilet for the sake of the child, the swollen feet, the anxiety for the health of the child. She needed the words of the angel, do not be afraid, Mary, all the days of her pregnancy. Every birth of every child has had dangers for mother and child. As Chesterton put it, but for the courage of mothers, none of us would have been born. One saving grace was her friendship with her older cousin, Elizabeth. Someone she could talk with when she couldn't talk with anyone else. One hopes Joseph had a friend as well. On our journey through life, we cannot make it alone, though we some days try. Mary and Joseph made it to Bethlehem and came to an end. Another journey was about to begin. Now let's move to our own journey, our spiritual journey toward God, with God, into God, with Jesus, with Jesus as our God. It is our own sacred journey toward our true self and toward God. As we arrive at one, we arrive at the other. Part of this journey is listening to your own life as God speaks into your life, not just with words, but with the events of your life. Frederick Buechner says that if he were to say in a few sentences what he has been trying to say through all of his writings as a novelist and preacher, it would be this. Listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is. In the boredom and pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments and life itself is grace. Our sacred journey is not an easy one as that of Mary and Joseph. There will be obstacles. We will lose our way, but the words of amazing grace are truth for me through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come, but grace hath led me thus so far, and grace will lead me home. Sometimes we don't know we've taken the wrong path for a while. I remember hiking in the mountains one day and discovering that I had lost my way. I couldn't see a path. I frantically searched for the place where I had left the path. I did before too long, but I remember the fear of that moment. We may be lost, but God, like the shepherd of Jesus' parable, will come get us and take us home. Jaber Crow, the main character in a Wendell Berry novel, says, This feeling, feeling came over me that I had strayed back onto the right path of my life. When this happens, we experience grace. We may feel we're just wandering in life, but a Tolkien character says to us this wisdom, all that is gold does not glitter, not all who wander are lost. As we listen to our lives, we will look back and see the presence of God with us all along. Times you suddenly found the right path again. Moments of truth and beauty and love. Times you were saved from injury or illness or death. Times when sin became, by the grace of God, the occasion of grace. Times when you were loved back to life. 
Deep sea divers tell of descending into the depths of the sea and reaching a point where the light on the surface, surface no longer penetrates the darkness of the water. They get anxious, but then their eyes adjust and they begin to pick up what one has called the luminous quality of the darkness. No matter how deep we go, how dark it gets, there in the darkness is the light of God. Wherever our sacred journeys take us, grace is by our side. There are holy moments and holy places in our lives. And some days we revisit them in our minds. And sometimes we even travel there. On the sacred journeys we are traveling from God to God, we hear this word from T.S. Eliot's poem, Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. This is our journey, and this is where it will end. God is our warm hearth, the welcoming arms, our first and last home. In this life, God sends us all out on a journey, and God will bring us home. Amen.